presenter is a man who has worked at the highest levels of American journalism. He has been a foreign correspondent, editor, and news industry executive, and an advisor to many. He has recently taken up the position of Chief Content Officer at Time Incorporated after leaving Bloomberg, where he was also the Chief Content Officer. He once edited the Wall Street Journal, which makes his presentation of our final award so fitting. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Norman Perlstein. Thank you very much, Scott, and um, thanks also for coming in on such short notice and doing such an extraordinary job this evening. Can we give her a round of applause? saddened by the circumstances that led to it. Um, uh, Lara Logan has been a valuable um, member of the CPJ board whose body of work has included a willingness to put herself in harm's way to get a story, and I'm one of those who certainly hopes that um, people recognize what an extraordinary career she has had. With circumstances, uh, stories that go awry, problems such as CBS has had, I tend to think that more often than not, it is really the editor sitting behind a desk directing the reporter who is more at fault and more to blame than the reporter. We, as editors, uh, tend to be quite schizoid in our work. We encourage uh, reporters to take extraordinary chances bring their passions to their work, and then we present ourselves as that last bastion between uh, the journalist who's been in the field doing the job and the reader or viewer. And it is often a very difficult task when a story gets an extraordinary head of steam uh, to stop it, and yet that quite often is really the way that editors do protect journalists. Um, and that brings me to our recipient tonight of the Burton Benjamin Award and to Bud Benjamin himself. Bud was uh, not surprisingly the vice president of CBS News um, who made his career um, really from 35 years of working as an extraordinary um, producer and news executive, but his real fame came in the wake of a story that was produced 35 years ago about General Westmoreland and about efforts to um, cook numbers uh, in terms of enemy casualties. Uh, that story led to an expose by TV Guide and to CBS deciding that it needed an independent um, ombudsman, a trusted news executive to write a report and that report by Bud Benjamin was one that not only pointed up the flaws of the report, but more importantly, the flaws in uh, the ways in which standards and procedures were administered at CBS, uh, leading to uh, increased care on the part of um, news executives, editors, and journalists in the wake of that. Um, I think it also helped David Boyce, who's here tonight, since he was defending CBS in the suit that resulted, and uh, of course Westmoreland dropped his $120 million suit after realizing that David Boyce would be on the other side. <laughs> uh, Paul Steiger is absolutely an appropriate and perhaps the most appropriate recipient of the Burton Benjamin Award in that he has, through his career, exhibited extraordinary courage as well as a judicial temperament that um, has led to the kind of great journalism uh, that uh, appeared wherever he has worked and continues to appear. Um, I first met Paul 35 years ago in Los Angeles. Um, he had started at the Wall Street Journal and then gone to the Los Angeles Times working in LA and Washington, was back in Los Angeles as a business editor. I was then at Forbes and Barney Kalame was the Wall Street Journal Los Angeles bureau chief and the three of us would get together regularly and talk about 
how great it was to be in Los Angeles and how awful it would be if we ever ended up in New York. Uh, I got here first in 1983 and uh, convinced both uh, Paul and Barney to follow. Uh, and Paul, um, working at the Journal um, as deputy managing editor for many years, took control of the newsroom in 1991. And in the years that followed, uh, was responsible for um, editing 16 Pulitzer Prize winners, um, as well as uh, every other award uh, being given to him and to the journal during that period. It was also a time which tested um, his resolve as a leader, um, having to protect journalists in a different kind of way. Um, on 9-11, the journal newsroom was blown out, and as many of you in this room know, um, Paul somehow got himself up to Barney's apartment where they produced um, an historic next day uh, edition of the Wall Street Journal and then um, took the entire uh, staff with him to New Jersey to set up a newsroom where um, the paper continued to come out in a way that its readers never knew a difference. Um, after uh, retiring uh, from the journal, of course, he went to ProPublica, where um, an organization dedicated to investigative reporting has already won two Pulitzer Prizes and has become a supplier of great stories for a number of publications around the world, very much including uh, Time and Fortune. So thank you, Paul. Um, also, like Bud Benjamin, uh, Paul was the chairman of CPJ for several years, and traveling with him on a fact-finding mission was really um, a chance to see uh, all of the brilliance and all of the uh, power that Paul could bring to a problem. We were in Russia together in 2008, uh, following the murder of uh, Anna Polskaya from Novoye Gazeta, and uh, Paul, uh, never losing his temper, never raising his voice, managed to insist on meeting with top Russian executives who were doing everything to avoid him. And by the time that trip was over, um, he had done more to establish uh, the need for rule of law in Russia than any other journalist that I could imagine. And uh, that's absolutely consistent with everything that I've seen throughout his career. And nothing could please me more than to uh, welcome him tonight. And uh, please, let's uh, give him a round of applause while he accepts this honor. on the CPJ board and staff. Um, anything that uh, we accomplished during my tenure was uh, up to you. And thanks to all of you uh, for coming and uh, uh, taking my uh, good friend Alberto Barguin's money. Uh, so very nice. In, in recent days, I thought a lot about the 16 previous recipients of the Burton Benjamin Award and reread the words from this platform of some of them. The words are inspiring. Um, their deeds are awesome. I'm humbled and deeply honored to be among them. The first honoree in 1997 was Ted Koppel of ABC, who for a significant time brought serious reporting to late night television with sustained high quality. The most recent, last year, 
was Alan Rusbridger of The Guardian, who has the vision to be a leader in reinventing journalism for the digital age and the courage to challenge both his government and ours on the extent to which they spy on us. Together, uh, and with those in between, they inhabit an arc of profound change that I want to reflect on very briefly tonight. The arc actually goes back to 1981, when Michael Massing and other young writers with overseas experience founded CPJ. American journalists were still basking in the reflected glow of all the president's men. The Robert Redford, Dustin Hoffman movie that five years earlier had won three Academy Awards and anointed Bob Woodward, Carl Bernstein, and by implication all reporters as rock stars with typewriters. Yes, typewriters. <laughs> Woodward and Bernstein's reporting in the Washington Post, based partly on tips from anonymous sources, helped drive President Nixon from office. This came only a few years after the Pentagon Papers case, in which the Supreme Court denied Nixon's motion to bar the New York Times and the Post from publishing leaks of the papers, which detailed abuses during the Vietnam War. U.S. journalists, in other words, were riding high. What Michael and his young colleagues saw was that journalists in America had it far better than those abroad, particularly those in repressive states. Americans had the protection of the First Amendment and the backing of wealthy, committed, and lawyer-stocked news organizations. In vast parts of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, reporters, editors, and broadcasters could be bankrupted, beaten, thrown into jail, or killed by powerful people offended by what they wrote. As the experience of our incredibly courageous honorees tonight demonstrates, in many places around the world, the life of a journalist who is determined to find and report the truth is no better today than it was 32 years ago. Reporters, editors, photographers, and publishers are still threatened, beaten, and murdered, often with impunity. The core mission of CPJ is just as critical as it ever was, in many respects more so. What has changed is the position of us, the American journalists. We are still far better off than our beleaguered cousins in danger zones abroad, of course. But financially, I don't need to tell this group of the hammering our industry has taken in the last decade. Publications shrinking or even closing, journalists bought out or laid off, beats shrunk or eliminated. And now, more recently, we're facing new barriers to our ability to do our jobs denial of access and silencing of sources. For the starkest comparison, I urge any of you who haven't already done so to read last month's report, commissioned by CPJ and written by Len Downey, former editor of the Washington Post. It lays out in chilling detail how an administration that took office promising to be the most transparent in history instead has carried out the most intrusive surveillance of reporters and were attempted. It has also made the most concentrated effort, at least since the plumbers and the enemies list of the Nixon administration, to intimidate officials in Washington from ever talking to a reporter. Consider this. As we now know from the Snowden documents, investigators seeking to trace the source of a leak can go back and discover anyone in government who has talked by phone or email with the reporter who broke the story. Match that against the list of all who had access to the leaked info, and voila. In my days editing the Wall Street Journal, I used to joke that no one in the Washington Bureau, anybody's Washington Bureau, ever had an on-the-record conversation. But now I would have to wonder whether anyone was having any kind of conversation at all that wasn't a White House sanctioned briefing. It isn't just words. The White House has been barring news photographers from all sorts of opportunities to ply their craft routine meetings and activities of the president, where they used to be able to shoot still and video images under certain constraints, now are often, not always, but often off limits, according to the Society of American News Editors, which is protesting the action, along with photographers groups and others. The administration has invited news organizations to pick up images handed out by the press office or from the White House website. 
sort of like saying, just print the press release, as some corporate PR people used to say to me years ago when I asked for an interview with the CEO. I don't mean to suggest that this administration is always and everywhere implacably hostile to journalists. After its snooping into communications of the Associated Press and of a Fox News reporter was revealed, the administration agreed to certain restraints. It agreed not to prosecute anyone for engaging in journalism. <laughs> News organizations will generally be given advance notice when the Justice Department wants access to their records so that they can resist in court. And warrants for access to a reporter's records won't be sought unless the reporter is a target of criminal investigation. Still, the government can waive these constraints if it can make the case that national security is involved. Sandy Rowe noted in announcing the Downing Report last month that the founders of CPJ did not anticipate the need to fight for the rights of U.S. journalists who work with uh, the protection of the First Amendment. Limited resources, she said, had to be directed at countries with the greatest need. Even with declining revenues at U.S. news organizations, the principal need is still abroad. But she added, and repeated tonight, Time has come for CPJ to speak out against excessive government secrecy here at home. As just one supporter of CPJ, I agree. If we are going to be credible admonishing, when we admonish abusers and journalists abroad, we can't stand silent when it is going on at home. One last thing. I don't want to leave the impression that I'm in despair. I'm definitely not. A couple of new billionaires, Jeff Bezos and Pierre Omidyar, have put up several hundred millions of dollars in funding to, respectively, rebuild one great old platform, the Washington Post, and erect an entirely new one. From New York to Texas to California and in scattered places in between, nonprofit reporting teams, ProPublica happily among them, are enjoying increased success with both their journalism and their fundraising. And new forms of web-based reporting, like BuzzFeed, are both attracting young audiences and sliding towards profitability. I confess that I was first cranky the other day when BuzzFeed stole one of our brilliant senior editors. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> But then I realized his new job is to recruit half a dozen reporters and start an investigations team. For society and for journalists, for journalism, that is progress. Can't rest. We need to stand up in stout opposition whenever the First Amendment is challenged at home. We need to speak out even more vigorously than before when journalists are abused around the world. We need to keep finding and fun funding more inventive ways to carry out serious reporting. And of course, we need to keep supporting CPJ. Thank you very much.